Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in my home studio with my colleague and close friend, the intrepid Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And uh, before we get uh, going here with our episode, just want to remind everyone, please follow us on social media. Please subscribe to our audio podcast. Please subscribe to our video channel. And if you're new to the channel, just Remind I remind people that we have sometimes different content. So we have some audio episodes that are not on the video channel. We have some video episodes that are not on the audio channel. So please consider jumping back and forth, some multimedia, if you want to consume all of our content. And again, we appreciate your, your support and following us, and thank you for the kind words. Anyhow, we're uh, starting a new kind of series here on the podcast, the the life and crimes of and then we pick a significant person from the underworld. So far, we've we've produced episodes, The Life and Crimes of Nikki Scarfo. Most recently, The Life and Crimes of Joe Messino. So we like to mix it up on the show. Sometimes we look at current events, sometimes historical case studies. Sometimes we have guests that we interview. So we like to mix it up. In this case, historical case studies of major underworld figures devote an episode to them. And uh, if you have some ideas for people that you'd like for us to record an episode about, please share it with us on social media. And uh, today's episode I'm pretty excited about is a Taco Bowman, who was, we're here in Detroit, I mean, just an icon in Detroit, but even nationally, internationally. He was a major figure in the Outlaws Motorcycle Club. He was the local president here in Detroit at one point, then became national president. Just a really fascinating individual compelling person of uh, very uh iconic game- in, the, in the underworld i mean pe- people really uh re- revered him I yeah, he was say. a game he was a game changer i mean someone that um really made a mark for himself and and established a legacy that was very unique uh in the sense that he took the paradigm of what a biker boss was and kind of flipped it on its ear uh, in terms of his ability to evolve and metamorphosize, he was like, I like to describe him as like a chameleon, somebody that could uh, change the way they looked and acted uh, a- around different people to uh, ingratiate themselves. And he was just as someone like Taco Bowman uh, was just as comfortable sitting there uh, with his, you know, his club lieutenants long hair tattooed boisterous drinking drugging and whatnot and then the next day cut his hair put on a three-piece suit get in a chauffeured limousine and go meet with the italian mafia or go meet with a um a a legitimate businessman yeah or go to like a parent teacher conference right right (laughs) send his kids to private yeah send his kids to private school moved into the detroit mafia's kind of their 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 compound their their uh the town that they controlled for even Going back up until the now yeah. the, you know gross point um a lot of them are out of there by now but yeah there's still kind of that uh flavor of of organized crime and in, in in the gross points which is the the real uh real affluent area uh just east of the city of detroit um and uh it, it's where the Detroit Mafia, the Toko Zerilli crime family, had their uh, couple blocks, Middlesex, Balfour, Charlevoix, uh, where where they uh, they all lived, like all next to each other in mansions. Um, and and that's where Taco Bowman, who had a very fruitful relationship with the Detroit Italian Mafia, they had some ups and downs. We'll talk. Yeah, about we'll them. get it. We'll get to that. Uh, yeah. But that's where eventually he moved when he became a uh, a biker godfather. Yeah, and again, and it's just to your point about how, how he could blend in. I mean, he was this is a very blue blood kind of affluent suburb, and he and he didn't raise any flags at all. I mean, he just blended in. No one. His really neighbor, his it. neighbors loved him. They were yeah, like, they, right. Yeah, but, he he uh, was out cutting his lawn every you know every weekend. He yeah. was, uh, you know, him and his family would show up in support of their kids' events at the schools. And yeah, I, I believe he took 
he uh, took the path or followed in the footsteps of the, the Toko's early crime family in terms of donating, you know, uh, money to the church and to charities to try to uh, craft a kind of an alternate image as a, a benevolent community leader. Yeah, I think I think when we talk about these underworld figures, that's usually the the smartest ones are the ones who are able to um, integrate into mainstream society. It's usually this the smart place. So so this is an outlaw biker episode. Taco Bowman, uh, a legend's legend. Um, we we have some interesting insight here because we'll get to it. Scott has actually had some some direct interaction with him. I've talked to some people that that knew him and um, both on the record and off the record. So anyhow, let, let's get into it. Taco Bowman, you want to you want to start us off, Scott, yeah, he, with uh, he, some of his early years, maybe? He grew up in Marysville, which, yeah. if you're from the Metro Detroit area, um, it's about an hour uh, to an hour and fifteen minutes uh, north of Detroit in the in the Port Huron area. Um, St. Clair County, I think, right? That's that's yeah. Outside, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a it's like a it's like a farm town. Yeah, like uh, you know, uh, corn-fed white boys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who uh, you go play Marysville in football? You you get a lot of uh, you know six foot four, three hundred pounders on the line that you know worked their dad's farm and woke up at six in the morning to carry bales of hay. Yeah, uh, and, and with uh, with the exurbs now, people actually those areas are starting to become developed now. But yeah, with another <laughs> more people are leaving the Detroit area, but whatever. Um, eventually made his way to Detroit um late 60s early 70s and and hooked up with the outlaws uh under lenny braun lenny the blonde who was uh i don't think he was the first detroit outlaw boss but i i could be wrong i apologize to any outlaw historians out there that that uh that would tell me that he was but i know he was very early on and was someone that was integral in building the outlaw brand in Detroit, Southeast Michigan, the Midwest, as well as an expansion in, into Canada. Um, and Taco was close to Lenny Braun, but he was also eventually uh, mentored by the club's international president, uh, Stairway Harry Henderson. Was he an Ohio guy? He was another he was Midwest a guy. Yeah, Dayton, Ohio guy. I think he yeah. also had um uh, uh ties or links to Indianapolis. Okay. Uh but uh I think he was from Dayton. I'm not sure if he had uh, parts of chapters in both Ohio and Indiana. Um but it, we know he was from Dayton and he was the president and the, the international president was the first person to take the outlaws outside of the United States. Uh, Stairway Harry was um and taught taco uh you know leadership skills in terms of not just running a regional regime but how to oversee a international biker club taco eventually became his vice president um when stairway harry had to step down or resign uh uh, because of legal issues that he that he wanted to concentrate on, he couldn't keep his entire focus on uh, continuing to expand and build the outlaws. Which by the eighties, early eighties, when Taco was taking over for Stairway Harry, I think it was eighty three or eighty four, um, the outlaws were on the ascent, um, starting to. They had, they had been at war with the Hells Angels for a decade at that point. The war between the Hells Angels and Outlaws started in 74, I think, or 73 or 74. Uh, but I think by the 80s, in terms of numbers and um, overall, uh, you know, where their tentacles spread uh, on a uh, more macro level, uh, they were starting to rival the hell's angels more than they had in the past and and they weren't i guess li they weren't little brother anymore and then when taco took over he took that into high gear um 
and you know ramped up hostilities between the outlaws and the hell's angels um put a heavy emphasis down in florida uh, which he saw as as uh fertile and and key territory uh for their for their outlaws uh brand and just became revered as he was more than just a crime lord. Uh, I, I heard, you know, some law enforcement say he had almost like a cult leader control or mysticism um, where he would draw people in and they would become subservient to him more so than a crime lord, almost like this the godlike figure. Yeah, um, I, I want to talk about that also at some point, like the the charisma and things like that. Um, but I just want to go back to some some chronology here. But I think he's before the big push in the 1980s. Wasn't he the Detroit president as early as what 1970? Right? I mean, it was pretty. pretty I don't know. Early. If it was, you think you think it was as early as 70? I'm not saying you're wrong. I, yeah. I don't know the exact dates. Yeah, someone I know, can fact check us on that. I but. think Lenny. I think that was still when Lenny. Braun was president. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I know at some point in the seventies, Taco Bowman took over the Detroit. Yeah, uh, this is a, a Detroit news article says he he was he was president of Detroit nineteen seventy. Okay. Well, I, so, hey, I, I don't so know. Maybe Braun. Maybe Braun. Uh, at least in terms of the interviews with the press in the seventies, Lenny Braun was the one that was presented as more of the mouthpiece i guess of that uh and he, he's the one who attempt maybe that was more the late 60s maybe mm -hmm. i'm messing up my timelines and yeah. i should have probably <laughs> did a double check before we jumped on this um pod but uh, i know uh, uh lenny's the one who, who tried to you know uh, move the outlaws headquarters onto that island um uh where, where you had uh it was like a hippie commune for a while um yeah, we talked about that in the in yeah. the Braun episode, the quick yeah. hitter we did about him. Where it was like so, a yeah. counterculture uh, hub. So yeah, the, the Detroit News is citing him as president as early as 1970. Then, yeah, so he'd been he was president for you know over a decade when he took over, well, when he became uh, vice president and then eventually president of the of International, and then he moved the headquarters of Outlaws uh, International club it moved it to detroit it had always been in uh, chicago or with uh you know a uh, stairway harry a uh, stairway harry uh, uh in ohio before that but uh, for the first time in the uh, early to mid 80s it moved to detroit and it stayed there until um, the late 90s early 2000s and a little bit of general history i'm i'm, I'm not a historian about you know outlaw bikers but um chicago was always the traditional hub before taco because that's where they start in illinois going back as as far back as the 1930s i, I think might be 1935 someone can yeah. fact check me on that but the um um was it the mccook mccook uh, yeah yeah M mccook outlaws and and they started off uh traditional like just guys who, who like to ride motorcycles A family club or, yeah 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 and um then then we get like sort of post hollister Right, the big the big rally in California where the term one percenter comes from, and then the, the outlaws, just like the Hell's Angels, they kind of run with that that yeah. branding and and image of uh, we're not just motorcycle enthusiasts, we're we're like some bad motherfuckers. <laughs> we're 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 not nice. And then people. by and by the seventies, it had transformed into fully vertically integrated criminal organizations. Yeah, that's what I was going to say about the ask you about about the Detroit scene because. Now this is you know this is going to be the the narrative from law enforcement. So I know we're going to get comments that that that's not what happened, but this is the narrative from law enforcement based on the cases that they made. That by the 1970s, um, the outlaws transitioned into more being involved in more of these criminal activities that Scott is talking about: extortion, gambling, prostitution, narcotics, and um, it's pretty well documented that during this time as part of that evolution into something that's, that's more, more heavily involved in criminal activities that they formed close relationships with the Italian mafia here in Detroit. 
um the the tokos are really family so can we can we talk about that like the 70s what was that vibe like and 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 taco kind of um being the liaison and 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 tapping into that network yeah and i think he again uh was a was an innovator and a and a pioneer in that he created a template for how a big city biker club can work hand in hand with that city's Italian mafia to both parties uh, benefit, you know, like that, that it's, it's a, uh, there's a lot of symbiosis and um, mutual reward if, if done properly. And I know it's, it's, they're, they're two kind of volatile, uh, you know, if, if you're going to make a, you know, a chemistry analogy, <laughs> two volatile elements that you put together and, you know, if it goes wrong, it can go really wrong. But um, Taco, you know, came up with the blueprint on, on how to make it go right. And I think that started to spread around the country. That hell, you know, there had been interactions between LCN and Hells Angels. Um, but uh, Taco was really the first outlaw to uh, formalize and um uh, flesh out and and fully embrace this um this the, this relationship and and these these ties and links that both sides could leverage to their advantage so yeah he did it through the jackalones uh which are the the detroit the jackaloni brothers were the detroit mafia street bosses um from the late 50s all the way into the 2000s um Anthony Tony Jack Jackaloni and his and his younger brother, an equally formidable mafia figure. He was no lackey or or no second fiddle. Uh, Vito Billy Jack Jackaloni, and um, Billy Jack was the good cop to Tony Jack's bad cop, and Billy Jack was the one who was really kind of getting his hands dirty with the rank and file, uh, and it was Billy Jack's crew that taco aligned with uh, well it's, it's something that's interesting i sorry to interrupt but also just to give people a sense of the landscape the socioeconomic landscape it's really interesting to me so you have the 1970s taco bowman outlaws mc their headquarters at that that time i, I believe was on was 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 on the east side of detroit you have the jack Lonies from soft war he was off war soft warren yeah um but 1970s Detroit at that point is a majority black city, majority African American city. Um less so than now, but still by the by the 1970s, like we're saying, Taco, he's living in Gross Point. The Italians are living in Gross Point, these affluent suburbs. So it's really interesting. You have these two white the Italians for all intent and purpose, race is a social construct. Italians considered white at that point. Well, Italians outlaw bikers two white organizations kind of holding it down together in a primarily black city i don't know i don't know where i'm going with that i just think it's interesting to point no, out. no i think but to to color that up a little bit it part of the benefit for taco and the outlaws in making that alliance with the jackalones is that by aligning with the jackalones that provides you access to the african-american uh criminal faction that exists that existed back then that were a sub subset or subunit of the Jackalones. Yeah. And even if you didn't want to work with them, if you had any issues with them, you could easily solve those issues through the mafia, through, through, through the Jackalones. So, so it was a smart in more ways than one, a very smart yeah. tactical decision to, to get in good with the Italians and not, and We'll, we'll get to this at the end, end of the episode and not to get too uh, far ahead of ourselves, but it's like history is repeating itself now uh, with what's going on with the outlaws and, and trying to combat uh, the pagans blue wave where they're re-solidifying their connections across the country with the Italian mafia. And to, I know it's not the exact same point you were making, but some of these, um, some of these alliances that the outlaws are making in addition to the Italian mafia have to do with black street gangs. So it's like, 
you know, any, any way you can, uh, protect yourself or, or, or turn a buck, you're, you're going to ignore the fact that you might be a different skin color or, or believe different, you know, have different yeah. philosophies on life or religions or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, so, and it, it's interesting also this time period, the seventies, because, um, like my understanding is that taco is a very hands-on biker president at this point. And, and I'm not comfortable saying who it is, but I have uh, an uncle who used to, be, <laughs> used to be friends with Taco and Frank the Bomb from the, from the Togo's Really family, and they would hang out. And, uh, yeah, they, he, 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 you know, Taco and Frank the Bomb were like what you would imagine. What you imagine they were, they were like some bad motherfuckers <laughs> going out to the bars together, you know, getting into fisticuffs with, with other dudes. <laughs> Dudes. Sometimes a knife is pulled, a gun is pulled. Like well, Frank, they, were, so, they were tough fucking dudes. Yeah, my well, just, that's my understanding. Well, Frank the bomb, who, who Jimmy's referencing, longtime Detroit mafia lieutenant enforcer, uh, acting capo of uh, uh, Frank Bomberito. They called him Frank the bomb. Uh, he was Billy Jackaloni's longtime best friend and right hand man, and he was. As street as street could That's be, I mean, yeah. <laughs> and he was somebody that could get a lot. If you were street, no matter what age, race, religion, if you were in the street doing dirt, he could get along with you. Um, and so he became uh, the Jackaloni, the Detroit mobs liaison to both the bikers and the African American uh, underworlds. And him and Taco, uh flock you know birds of a feather flock together and they right. gravitated to each other really early on in the 1970s and became very very close and uh like you said they were they were rabble rousers um uh both guys that wanted to keep a their finger on the pulse uh, of the streets you know at that point frank was just a soldier uh he didn't really reach um he, he became Billy Jack's acting cop when Billy Jack went to prison um, in, in the uh, uh, 90s and, and 2000s. So at that point, Frank was just a soldier and Taco was a boss. But um, they they were, you know, they were nitty gritty. They, they mm -hmm. did not want to um, Taco. And, and I don't know if Taco, I, I don't think Taco moved to Gross Point until the 80s. Y yeah, right, right. Not in the, right, in the 70s. I yeah. think he still lived in Detroit. Uh, yeah. At, Actually. So, so, uh, you know, they were guys that were getting their hands dirty. Uh, they, they were very, very tied in to street activity and, and being with the rank and file. Um, and, right. and Frank introduced Taco to that world and Taco introduced Frank to that world that, you know, the, the biker world. And, um, they they spent a lot of time together. They were more than just uh, business associates. They became very close friends and and socialized together and vacationed together and so forth. But I mean, and as you point out, moving forward in the chronology, Taco is someone who's not doesn't seem content to just be a Detroit guy. That that he has aspirations for regional leadership, national leadership, international leadership. So if you I don't know if you want to yeah, well he had direction. a he had a vision. And again, if you want to tie it into today, I think there's a lot of analogies to be made with Conan the Barbarian in New York. I, I see him as a modern day Taco Bowman. What he's doing with the pagans is kind of exactly what Taco did with the outlaws. I mean, Stairway Harry got, you know, started moving in that direction, expanding uh, across the pond in in um, and and getting outside the U.S. borders. But um, what Conan Barbarian, uh, what Conan Richter is doing right now, it, it echoes a lot of what Taco was doing in the 80s and, and building the, the Outlaws brand and and putting and, and driving them so they have ties and tentacles everywhere, not just in the biker community, but you know, in the police departments, in the, in the courts, in the um, with other criminal factions, with in legitimate businesses. Um, and, and making them and, and building them beyond the biker stereotype. Um, yeah. And, and also um, and being, being, about, being, being business minded, all about yeah, their business. Yeah. Um, and also 
and I wonder if some of that influence came from hanging around the Italians. I, I don't know, but it w- wouldn't uh, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, you've, we we know other case studies where that happens, like here here in Detroit. Not to totally go down another rabbit hole, but um, Larry Chambers, you know, for the Chambers brothers, infamous African American crime organization here. He did time with some Italian dudes, and he he talks about this in his own man in his own uh, what do you call it? He he I don't know if he published it, but his um, memoirs. Yeah, that 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 he learned a lot from the Italians in prison, in federal about, prison. Uh, yeah, about how to come out and and run shit, right? And, and, and Larry, organize them. Um, they called him Marlo or uh, Rambo. Uh, when Marlo Chambers came out of prison, uh, for again, we're going down a rabbit hole, but just to give people context, <laughs> if anybody has seen the movie New Jack City. And what Nino Brown did at the Carter, which was the uh, housing project that they took over and turned into a 24-7 drug emporium, that was based on what Larry Mm -hmm. Chambers did when he came out of prison, learned what he did from the Italians, and immediately went and bought (laughs) an apartment building that was called the Broadmoor and turned it into what became dramatized as the carter so yeah and he, maybe larry, larry chambers might be a good example for another life but detroit, i think so to me the, the 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 through line here is that and we're biased we're, we're detroiters but it my research tells me that in detroit specifically more so than other areas there's a certain entrepreneurial spirit that exists within the street hustlers no matter what race, religion, what faction you're in, where the the goal is to be larger than life and bigger than just where you grew up from or where your block is or where your organization is headquartered out of. Um, The idea is to keep pushing the envelope and, and, there's, there's always, just like I said, there was no method to the, there's method to the madness. There's, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that a lot of this correlates to, and maybe I don't want to annoy people. I'm going to get pretty academic here. I think it totally makes sense when you look at this is the Motor City, the big three. Yeah. I, I think it, I think it's in the, I think it's in the bloodstream of, of this area. What, what you're talking about. People aren't fit. It's not like, it, it, and I'll do respect to LA and New York and the street factions that exist there, but people in Detroit, for the most part, over the, they ain't fighting over city blocks. They're, they're fighting so they can have enough money to go buy five mansions in the suburbs, have a island of their own in the Bahamas and travel to Europe on a right. Like that's the goal for guys whether they be black guys italian guys or biker guys in detroit and that i think taco embodied that that you know he wanted to do it big and he wanted to do it smart and he wanted to do it organized and he he had this this vision and again the same way that conan richter right now has a vision for the pagans uh taco had this vision to to build the outlaws into this Midwest monolith uh, that that had control over Florida and uh, control over in Europe and Australia, New Zealand and Canada um, and rival, you know, do what the hell's angels do, but do it better. Well, that's, that's where I want to transition to because I agree. So he's ambitious. He wants not only a regional powerhouse, national, international. Okay. That's fine. Well, here's the problem. The Hell's Angels have already have already done that, and so we're going to see some some serious conflict and 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 disagreements <laughs> over um, you know territories and things like that. And a so, lot of it was keeping the Hell's Angels out of the Midwest in places yeah. like Milwaukee and Chicago and Detroit. They never came in. Recently, there's a allegedly a Hell's Angel chapter up north or out in Mount Pleasant. Um, they're you know on the Hell's Angels website it says something, but the Hell's Angels, for the most part, have always that's, stayed. And out that's of pretty far from Detroit. I mean, yeah. it's, it's obviously Michigan, it's the Midwest, but that's pretty far from but Detroit. Ohio, yeah. Ohio, Wisconsin, Illinois, there were uh, very, very uh, brutal, brutal 
wars, uh, car bombing attacks, murders that sprinkled across the 80s and 90s with the uh, outlaws uh, keeping, you know, keep trying to keep the Hells Angels out, out of those areas. Yeah, not so much didn't really happen in Detroit, but Chicago. It, it got yeah, Ohio, pretty, pretty Ohio bloody. Cleveland, uh, Chicago, Milwaukee. There was a murder in Toledo um, in the uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, where you had uh, the whole Hells Angels administration with Sonny Barger came to town for the trial. And I believe it was a, it was an outlaw that was trying to, uh, that was making their bones and killed a, I think it was a Cleveland hell's angel in Toledo, or maybe it was a Toledo hell's angel, but there was a trial and Sonny Barger and his whole crew came in and rented a bunch of houses in Toledo for the trial. So that, so that was in, that was as close. Up until the uh, the chapter got opened here in Detroit a couple of years ago by the Hells Angels, and we don't know what the status of that chapter is. We really haven't heard anything about them um, outside of some uh, some FBI wires or DEA wires last year with an arrest of a guy that was allegedly selling guns to outlaws who were talking about going to war with the Hells Angels. But other than that, we really ha hadn't heard about much activity the closest the Hells Angels had ever gotten to Detroit was that little Toledo incident, and, and I think it was seventy nine or eighty. But isn't that isn't that part of the strategy to expand not only in the Midwest but the American South, Canada, internationally? Is because otherwise the Hells Angels are going to take over everything eventually, right. right? Isn't that part of the right? So, and just for people, I'm sure everybody knows this. I'm not trying to belittle our audience, but Hells Angels West Coast Club started in California. Um, eventually came east in the 70s and set up shop in New York and I believe Boston um, but did not have a big Midwest presence because of the outlaws so I don't want to say it was a, a peace conference but uh, like a, a detente between the Hells Angels and the outlaws happens where Taco Bowman actually sits down with a high ranking member of the Hells Angels our friend George Christie, who's been on our show before, he was a major player in the Hells Angels, and and he and Taco, this is pretty remarkable. They actually they actually sit down, like face to face, and, and have uh, a conversation. I I don't want to say a peace summit; that's an overstatement, but at least to lower the temperatures. And I, and I think it was that? I think it was over a couple of days. Yeah, um, and. According to George and according to other people I've spoken to, it looked like for a period of time that they were going to come to some agreement, some type of ceasefire. And then uh, Kevin O'Neill, a.k.a. Spike, uh, who was a, a shot caller out in um, Milwaukee, uh, put the kibosh on it. Um, I know I misidentified him in a, in a previous episode. I was calling him Spike O'Donnell. I apologize to all my Irish friends. I'm not trying to <laughs> O'Donnell and O'Neill are totally different. I'm, I, I'm so this is, I'm talking about Spike O'Neill. Not um, just want to correct myself, but uh, he convinced taco to uh, walk away, even though it looked like they were making some headway in um, putting, putting, you know, letting bygones be bygones. But all, it, all it did after that was, was pop off even crazier. Yeah, and it gets it gets really murky too because I think around the same time, and this seems like always be the case, there are also undercover informants who are trying to fan the flames, right? So if like George and Taco are trying to like lower the temperature, it doesn't help that you have informants, uh, you know, uh, trying to escalate violence because that I mean that's what law enforcement wants, and then they can go prosecute these guys. So. Um, but so th in that environment, it was pretty remarkable that, that those two would sit down. I think. But so, so that's at like the national level, uh, uh, very macro at the same time, going a little bit more micro in the local level, uh, on the home front for taco Bowman, uh, his, his, at that point, about a 15 to 20 year relationship that he had had that had been very fruitful with him and the Italian mafia, um, go South for a couple months and he has a contract put on his head uh, by the Jackalones 
and uh, we don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole here, but just to give people um, a little bit of context, um, based on intelligence files and informants and wiretaps, it looks like and not people every- we've talked to, right? Pers- and people we've talked to, right? Interviewed per- off the record. It, it, not everything was what it seemed um, on its surface with that. It looks like Tony Jackaloni and Billy Jackaloni, who were, you know, the final word on the street. It looks like they were manipulated a little bit by their protege and reputed current Detroit Mafia Don Jackie Jackaloni, um, who I think there was some jealousy um, with Taco Bowman. I think there was, uh, I think there was some fear um, with with Taco Bowman. And I think Taco sensed that and tried to test it um, and began pushing in on uh, some of Jackie's uh, dice games and card games and some other shakedowns that they were doing and kind of instead of handling it himself uh he ran to his dad and his uncle and if again if you believe the wiretaps um that were 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 put forth in the uh, operation uh, game tax that historic bus that took down the whole detroit family in the 90s it looks like jackie was shading the truth to Billy and Tony about what was going on and convince Billy and Tony that Taco should have, should be hit. Um, when I think other people believe if, if Jackie was more buttoned up in his business and handling his business, uh, there wouldn't have been any issues. Yeah. Let me add a few more things to this. So actually the FBI gets wind of this and they go to Taco and warn him that, that the Italians, have a contract out on him and they actually ask taco to cooperate and if 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 you can imagine a guy like taco boma what's he gonna <laughs> he tells him to get fucked right he yeah. tells him don't worry about me like you know um so that doesn't go anywhere but it is interesting that they that they they tried to tip him off um and then we also know that the jackaloni is interestingly enough try to contract it out to another faction within the Toko Zerilli family, specifically Tony Zerilli's faction. Who are, who, that's how we know about this, because they were all, uh, they <laughs> right. weren't wired up. The car they were driving in was wired up. Yeah. So they yeah. were, they, they, there was a wire up on that car for literally two and a half years, I think between 91 into early 94. Um, and they had two and a half years of shop talk. And yeah. this was when they got the contract and they're talking to each other being like, this doesn't sound right. Like, mm-hmm. why would we be doing this? What do we basically, what do we want a war? We're going to kill this guy and we're going to have all the outlaws coming after us. These are on, these are unhinged, you know, mentally unstable criminals. They don't, they, they're very impulsive. Um, and there was not just talks between them in the car, but they had to go to some sit downs and while they were driving to the sit down, they would have their brother, their dad, Tony Z, you know, their uncle, the actual underboss. And you could hear them discussing this. And it was basically, um, I don't know who got assigned the job, but someone from that faction had, was sent to Tony Jack to explain their feelings on what was happening and feeling that uh, they were basically kind of being sold a bill of goods by Jackie. And even if Jackie had some merit to what he was saying, what he was asking you to do uh, in their mind, wasn't the right move. Right. Um, Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I know they cleared it up with Tony Jack and then, Tony Jack reached out to Billy who reached out to Frank the bomb and uh, there was a series of sit downs and it got, uh, it got settled. Yeah. It's really, it, I love, I love the, the machinations and minutia of these situations where two groups overlap. So 
the the members of this Israeli faction, first of all, to Scott's point, they, something doesn't smell right here, right? Like in terms of the reason why we would do this. Second of all, they're thinking this is very foolish to start a war with the Outlaws Motorcycle Club. <laughs> it's very foolish because it's not just the Detroit chapter, right? Taco is a big deal nationally. Like you're going to have the whole fucking nation of Outlaws Nation come after us. That's not smart. But third of all, back to this idea of Taco was a charismatic guy. Those guys actually liked Taco, and 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 they and they they didn't want to kill him. He he was a popular guy with, to your point, the rank and file of the the Italian mafia. They liked Taco, and they didn't feel good about this. And um, everything that I've read and people that I've talked to, back to his idea of being a charismatic leader, was people seem to genuinely like him, even to the extent of people in law enforcement. You can look at the record, people in Detroit PD, FBI, have this kind of begrudging uh, admiration for Taco where they say, you know, like you sort of like the guy, but you have an obligation in law enforcement to go after him. But he was a really well-liked person. But uh, it, also, it also shows you how Taco's mind works, that he didn't care that Jackie Jack Looney was the prince. No. I mean, th this is... I'm not pro Jackie, but this is like, I guess, I guess it is in Jackie's defense in terms of this situation where Taco saw Jackie in Taco's mind. Jackie was a weak link. Mm -hmm. Jackie wasn't like his dad and uncle. Right. Taco looked at him as a silver spoon gangster mm -hmm. who he felt he could muscle. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, whether or not Jackie should have been prepared or should have reacted differently we could that could be debated till the cows come home but the fact is taco felt like i don't i might be boys with the jackalonies it, we might be doing great business together i love frank the bomb i love billy i love tony but i see a weak spot that i can take in it that i can oh, take yeah. advantage for myself and my group yeah social darwinism by, right by moving jackie out of certain you know spots in the underworld certain games I think most of this was over dice games. Um, but I, I thought there was a there was even um, an argument made by the Zerilli faction that that the way Jackie made the case is not what was happening. Right. Yes, well, I don't. Think, I, mean, I, st I still don't <laughs> think we know for sure. Yeah. What the situation really was. Right. Right. Um, that that taco wasn't necessarily muscling in. Because that was the way Jackie framed it, and um, it was disrespectful, and he was muscling in. And I've heard that that that's not exactly what was what was happening, and and, and maybe Jackie well, he was was, was misleading because he Jackie wanted Taco out of the way for his own right. reasons. Yeah, and uh, you know those those games, the outlaws did security for those games. Yeah, so it wasn't like. The outlaws were coming out of nowhere, yeah, coming out of left field. <laughs> right. It's like they were helping with the games. Yeah. But what I heard was that part of the what was part of what was being sold to the Jackaloni brothers by Jackie as a shakedown was the outlaws asking for a legitimate compensation package. Yeah. For bringing. Uh, customers and right. for providing security. Yeah, right, right. Which is not unreasonable. I mean, right. in, and that they that, that he was holding back on them as opposed to them moving in and saying, "Jackie, move, move out. We're taking over this whole game." Yeah. But, so, with, with back to like Taco's situ overall situation. So, things the 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 um, tenuous peace with the Hell's Angels doesn't last. He knows the Italians have a contract out on him. So now Taco is going to be more elusive, like where he's traveling and he's going to have, he's going to beef up security. And uh, he, you know, he seems to be aware of the, the, the high well, stakes here. Bulletproof Rolls Royce. Yeah. Right. That's right. right. That's a, so, that's uh, an example. So he's taking he's, this pretty seriously, all this stuff. Yeah. And he sets his sights on Florida and he had had his sights on Florida, um, you know, early on in his, in his reign. It, he sends um, a guy that had been running the Toledo chapter 
uh, Wayne Hicks, who they called Joe Black. He sends Joe Black down there uh, to open a Fort Lauderdale chapter and really plant the flag uh, for Florida being outlaw territory and for people wanting to come into Florida uh, as bikers having to go through the Hells Angels. And uh, Joe Black has a guy, uh, his right hand is a guy, uh, DK Lemonian, who is a, you know, this is this is rogues. These guys are all like a rogues gallery, like a ragtag group of, of uh, you know, scrappy, <laughs> grungy, grimy, uh, uh, you know, underworld figures that, like Jimmy said, they they fit everything you would think about a biker. Uh, that they fulfill those, you know, they fill those stereotypes. And then uh, there's another guy down in Florida who's the regional president, uh, Bill Pilgrim. They call him Wild Bill, and uh, those guys are tacos, you know, boots on the ground down in Florida. Um, at the same time. You have a big Hell's Angels push into uh, Chicago and Milwaukee, um, and Taco orders the orders go out to combat that um, infringement at, at all costs, and a lot of it comes in. Um, we've talked about this before in biker uh, content about you know, how uh, logistically uh, the biker uh, political pecking order is constructed where you have the, the kind of the mother clubs, the, 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 the name brand clubs, and then you have support clubs or puppet clubs, which are smaller, lesser known clubs that are underneath the banner of the bigger club and are kind of beholden to that bigger club. And I know in, in, um, in Chicago, they set up a, 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 a subset of the Hells Angels called the Hells Henchmen. And uh, throughout 93, 94, 95, there were a series of, of murders and car bombings. Uh, one of them took place up in Rockford, which is in between Milwaukee and Chicago. Um, so there was, you kind of had, once the Italian um, issue was resolved, at one point, I guess he was fighting wars on three fronts. He was fighting with the Italian, or four fronts if you count the government. Uh, he's, he's fighting the Italians. He's got what's going on in, in Chicago, Milwaukee, and he has what's going on down in Florida. But once the Italian situation is, re is resolved, and this is 93, 94, um, he's got these you know, Midwest, down South, um, and, and quite a bit of uh, brewing tensions between them and, and, and rival clubs. Well, in Florida, I think the outlaws viewed it as their as their territory. the 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 challenge was the the warlocks were already there, and they were um, you They're know a formidable club with their own in their own right. And they were um, I, I they believe were aligned with yeah, the Hell's Angels. Yeah, um, and there's there was even some evidence brought to Taco's attention that that the president of the warlocks. Uh, at least this is from this was in the court documents. I, yeah. I don't know if people have insight they can share with us that maybe that wasn't true. But according to the investigation, that uh, he wanted to patch over with the Hell's Angels to kind of protect as as protection against this yeah. the outlaws taking over. And it should be noted that the the person we're talking about, Raymond, uh, the Bear Chafin, Bear Chafin, um, had been an outlaw. Well, Taco knew him as one of his lieutenants. He left the outlaws, passed over the warlocks, and then wanted to, you know, was a boss of the uh, of the warlocks, and then uh, or affiliated with the warlocks, and then wanted to jump to the Hell's Angels. And and it's pretty it's pretty violent because at one point the outlaws firebomb the warlocks headquarters, you know. So this was this was generating a lot of news, uh, not only locally in Florida but also nationally as like a biker conflict. So they killed uh, Raymond the Bear Chafin is killed in February of 91. Um, in the spring of 92 at uh, Daytona Biker Week, one of the uh, outlaw prospects or probates, who they called Hitler, um, sucker punches the outlaw boss 
from Atlanta, uh, Moose McLean, at a wet t-shirt contest. And Hitler is unceremoniously uh, stripped of his prospect status, um, taken to a hotel suite in Daytona Beach, beaten, uh, his all of his outlaw gear is taken from him, and he is thrown off of a balcony. Uh, about a five store balcony. Yeah, I think it was like the third floor or something. Yeah, I, I, yeah. That that's how uh, the Taco Bowman crew rolled. Yeah. Um, well, that was. I, I mean, I'm not justifying violence, but that that was pretty uh, yeah. bad mistake to put your hands on. Uh, you know, this is just I just trying to just trying to give a glimpse into how uh, Taco administered um, oh, yeah. dis- discipline within yeah. the club. Uh, and then, you know, in 93, there was a situation with a Florida uh, outlaw called Turbo, Turbo Tally, and he had uh, gotten some trouble up in Canada and had allocated, I think, to an extent where he admitted that the outlaws did business in Canada in a signed statement in his court file. And uh, he was called to Detroit and picked up at the airport by two of Taco's uh, lieutenants and and held captive for like five days in the outlaws uh, east side clubhouse and uh, mercilessly beaten and um, allegedly sodomized uh, and then put on a, a, a plane and, and stripped of his colors. So, you know, that, that was kind of the lead up to New Year's Eve 93 which became this this date in outlaws history that is you know, infamous and filled with mythology and mystique, uh, where there was a New Year's Eve party um, down in Florida for all of the the big shot outlaw lieutenants from around the country, um, as well as I think a rank and file. Uh, they had a banquet hall and a several suites that were all connected together and he gave a speech that became known as the rot the rottener speech and we all know in the english language there is no there's no such word as rottener but we all know what you know the gist of what he was trying to to tell them and it was a uh, it was a pep talk um a uh, inspirational motivational speech to encourage more uh, an escalation of the war against the hell's angels. And he said, we're going to be rottener than we've ever been uh, in the history of our club. And we're going to take the fight to the hell's angels. And I think he was in front of hundreds, if not a thousand outlaws uh, that were in front of him. Um, And it was just something that became part of his legend. Um, And then (laughs) subsequently, uh, 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 there was an uptick in in violence and 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 in the warfare between the Hell's Angels and Yeah, I think that firebombing of the Warlocks Club was at, was is in ninety four. So that that makes sense that that chronology. And one of the problems for Taco though is he, they have a a prospect in the Daytona Club, Mike Lynn, who who becomes a full patched. I believe he was he was fully patched over at one point. Um. And he gets really close to Joe Black, right? Yeah, and he and he, I think he was also acting as like um, maybe a bodyguard for Taco at some point too, as as part of his prospecting. But he makes a decision to cooperate with the federal government, which is really interesting because he's not a guy who's jammed up, as far as I know. He was not someone who's jammed up on some on on anything, any charges. I think he has. Uh, I don't know what would you say, a change of faith or something. I I, I don't know what what you would what his motivations were but he he on his own and and i believe like at first the fbi was suspicious and didn't like like this is what he was a double they thought he could have been a double agent yeah they they, because you know he just he literally just walked into the fed office and said um i'll wire up and um so that this is sort of like the 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 beginning of the end for for taco bowman and then in, in 94 um he starts really concentrating on what's going on in uh, Chicago and Milwaukee. And I know there were some trips that the uh, ATF and uh, FBI followed taco uh, 
to Chicago, a drive from Detroit to Chicago, which is about four hours. Um, and then subsequently, a couple days later, they saw some of the Chicago and Northwest Indiana bosses coming to Detroit. And they had some informants in uh, some of these meetings. And it was for Taco to implore uh, these lieutenants to keep firebombing uh, Hell's Angels affiliate clubhouses. And, and in, um, I believe it's February or March of 94, uh, they attacked two clubhouses and burned them to the ground uh, around the Chicago area. Um, and, and that's where those those couple meetings uh, in, in the first couple weeks of 94, first with Taco going to Chicago and then with the Chicago and Indiana guys coming to Detroit, that's where the uh, that, a lot of that or most of that was planned. Um, and we know that from from Mike Glenn from him, because other guys flipped too. Yeah, eventually it, it made it into the into the indictment into the court into uh, Taco's uh, case that they eventually brought a couple years after that. Yeah, um, there was another incident where he was Taco got upset. One of his close friends, Buffalo Wally, uh, who ran the Buffalo New York chapter, was was killed in a in a big uh, fight between the the Hell's Angels and the Outlaws. Out in New York, was that the Lancaster? Yeah, New York Lancaster, Spe Lancaster yeah. Speedway. Yeah, and there was a tell, uh, not television. Well, there was television coverage of the funeral of the Hell's Angel, um, who died. There was a one outlaw who died and one Hell's Angel who died, and that the outlaw was Buff uh, Buffalo Wally, and the Hell's Angel was a guy they called Mad Mike, and there was a. Video footage and I think a photo in a newspaper of an outlaw affiliate club at the funeral and giving condolences. Oh, yeah, yeah. To the Hell's Angels that did not play well with uh, Taco yeah. and he. Um, but I think and I think those guys they they knew. I think that the one of those outlaws knew that guy from like uh, maybe a like an Alcoholics Anonymous support thing or something. Like there were he knew that he he knew somebody in that hell's angels club on a personal level. And so didn't, didn't have like a problem with him, but that didn't go over well with. Yeah. Well then well, what he did, what he didn't just take it out on. No, the, the guy, he, right. He right. stripped the entire affiliate club of any uh, affiliation with the outlaws and ordered them to Tampa uh, to the, uh, the Killsboro chapter Hillsboro County. The people, in, uh, the outlaws that 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 operate out of the Tampa St. Pete area in Hillsborough County, they call Killsborough, and um, they ordered the whole fifth. They were called the uh, I think they were called the um, the uh, fifth something with the fifth uh, the fifth fifth chapter or something. They had a weird name, and he ordered the whole club uh, to report to the Tampa Outlaws uh, headquarters, and they were assaulted with bats and chains, uh, stripped of their outlaw colors and or their patches their patches and right. told to never come back again um and then in 94 you had the uh, murder of a uh, northwest indiana uh, uh outlaw chicago uh, for people that don't understand the midwest uh, geography uh northwest indiana is like a suburb of chicago like you can be in downtown Chicago from Northwest Indiana in like 10 minutes, five minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this guy's name was big Don fog. I think. Oh uh, yeah. Don yeah. fog was a guy from Northwest Indiana. That was, I think a part of the Chicago uh, outlaw chapter. And they thought he was a, they thought, thought he was, he was an informant. informant. Yeah. Was that, has uh, that ever been confirmed by the way? What was, 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 was it? We don't know. It, I don't know, but it was charged. Uh, in in that case, and, and uh, Taco gave the contract to Joe Black and those and those Florida guys. And then in '94, another New Year's Eve speech. This one not as um, impassioned or as as uh, uh, infamous, um, but '94 uh, New Year's Eve. I think there was less people there, um, more of like the inner circle, and he. Uh, he tells his his brain trust 
that we're we're not just going to stick to our guns in the area that we feel comfortable in, in the Midwest, Florida. We're going to take the fight to the Hells Angels out west. We're going to go to California and start killing Hells Angels, and we're going to start with George Christie, who he yeah, had I know. his conference with. Yeah, that was in the that was in the in the court documents. Yeah, that um, yeah, we, that's something we can ask George about. Um, uh, allegedly, I, you know, at least that's what that's what was in the the, the court case. And in, and in, who knows what happens if the if the indictment ever comes down? I mean, I think yeah. the only re- they yeah. they weren't su- they had gone out there a couple times, they were not successful. I think they would have continued to go out there and hunt Christie if uh, the uh, major indictment doesn't land in '97, and uh, Taco has to go on the run for two years. Yeah, what what was the chronology? So we know we mentioned already Mike Glenn was sort of the catalyst to he was the first guy to wire up. At, in the Daytona chapter, he was, um, and then, but then other guys flip too. But 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 the Joe, Joe Black. Get indi- who got indicted? You know what I'm saying? Did they flip Joe after Black. the indictment or no? I think uh, Joe Joe. I'm uh, I'm pretty sure Joe Black. I don't. I, I I'm sorry. I don't know the chronology, but Joe yeah, Black right. ended up being the biggest fish that they flipped, and he was so close to Taco. He was yeah. doing all of Taco's dirty work down in Florida. Um, and, and he ended up being, um, I'm not sure if they flipped him before the indictment or right. after the indictment, but at the trial in, in 2001, I think, uh, Joe Black was the star witness, Wayne Hicks, Joe Black, aka Joe Black, and then uh, Lemonian, who was Steve Lemonian, who was, who was, who the was Joe Black's, yeah, Joe Black's right hand, yeah, who was who ran the Daytona chapter, yeah, he was the Daytona president, um, but before the trial. It's interesting to point out that when the indictment comes down, Taco uh, is nowhere to be found. And right. he's actually placed on the FBI's most wanted list. I'm not sure if there's ever been another outlaw biker on that list. Not that, you know, that I that I'm aware of. And he was on the run for uh, almost two years. I think the indictment came in August of 97 and he was rounded up in May or June of of 99. Um, and he was being hid in, you know, outlaw uh, safe houses, uh, both here and abroad. Um, I know he was in Canada. Um, eventually, they uh, they got him on a. He was caught speeding. Um, they didn't realize who he was. I think he had a fake uh, identification. But they had even back then they had a a, a cam a, a camera on the police vehicle, and they had him with his girlfriend, um, who he had taken on the run. I don't know if he took her on the run right off the bat, or if he did like a Whitey Bulger who like took one woman on the run for a year, brought her back to Boston, picked up another woman who then went with him to California for the next fifteen years, but. Uh, he in uh, summer of uh, spring of 99 uh, he's pulled over i believe somewhere out west um and eventually he makes his way back to, to detroit he's being hid by the italians uh, frank the bomb is hiding them um and they finally found, they they theorized that the the best way to get taco was to go through his wife um who was Irish and uh, quite a tough, tough lady in her own right. And uh, they knew that she would be upset if they showed her the the police uh, vehicle cam footage of uh, Taco and his girlfriend in the car. She's living in the Detroit suburbs, I believe. At that yeah, time. she's still alive, I think. Um, but uh, she eventually gives him up and they find him at a house in Sterling Heights, Michigan, which is... You know, probably 15 minutes out of Detroit. Um, it's, you know, 10 minutes from Gross Point. Would you say that, Jimmy? Yeah. 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 It's not far from 10, from 15 minutes. Yeah. Because Detroit, Detroit to Gross Point, they border each other. You can and it's be all in, east. It's all east yeah. side. Gross Point, Sterling Heights is all east side. Gross Point's more far east side. And the, and the bomb, uh, you know, his territory was 
uh, s- southeast, uh, the uh, South Warren, South Sterling Heights, South um, Roseville. Uh, he was somebody that uh, existed in this area that was that's that's a hodgepodge of lower income, white, black, biker. It's it's an interesting uh, area right around uh, like eight and Gratiot, eight and Hoover. Um, well, especially by the nine by the nineties, it had it, yeah. it, it was it was what you're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that that was that was Frank's. You know, Frank loved it, you know, and, and you know, Frank uh, thrived in that environment. Uh, but he yeah, was hot. by the way, Taco was pulled over in Nevada, in Nevada. Okay. That's where they that you were right out west. Um, and they did you have do you have a date on when they apprehended him? Um, I did have it up here, but um, I lost I know it, it was already. late May or June of 99, and uh, it took him two years to um bring him to trial he's uh, at june 7th i just found it june 7th 99 uh, in the afternoon they find him on a house on a s- suburban street look like it you know probably looks like any small not yeah, it was even, not it was, any non- suburb. it was non nondescript for that yeah. neighborhood i mean that's a solid middle class neighborhood yeah. but that i thought that was one of his houses though wasn't that that wasn't a safe house wasn't that one i mean maybe it wasn't in his name but wasn't that a house that he lived in i'm not certain okay but i know that when he was back in detroit the bomb was moving him from house to house and the, yeah. the, the feds had brought the bomb in a number of times thinking they could squeeze the bomb for information oh where, yeah right where, where taco was. <laughs> He's like trying to bomb, get Taco to talk. Yeah, yeah the bomb. Happen. So, so uh, it played. It hit the siren, Benny. Uh, I I got to know Frank the Bomb pretty well in the last couple of years of his life. Um, you know, full disclosure. I'm sure that you know his falling out with Jackie Jackaloni played a role in his desire to feed me information. Um, when when Billy Jackaloni died, uh, Jackie kind of demoted Frank the Bomb. And uh, he was very unhappy with that. And then put him on the shelf, right? After put the him on the shelf, year. like in terms of Detroit LCN. But believe me, Frank was was as active as active could be until the day he died. Um, he was just doing his own stuff, and at that point wasn't wasn't sharing. And I know they had some issues with the bikers that they tried to reach back out to Frank and say, "Hey, can you help us?" And Frank was like, "Go fuck yourself." Yeah. Um, but uh, and then Frank also thought that. Jackie and those guys might have tried to kill him. Um, there was a situation where Jackie called for Frank, and uh, Frank showed up at a McDonald's at nine in Woodward. I know, you know, I I, I lived by that uh, intersection for quite a while. And um, when he got there, Jackie wasn't there. A couple other guys were there and said, "Hey, we're going to take you to Jackie." And Frank said, "The fuck you are! I ain't going with you." Uh, he had never, whenever Jackie had called to meet him. Jackie was always there because for so many years they were Billy Jackaloni's top guy. So they had to communicate a lot. Um, so he was not used to showing up and then, and then someone being, uh, you know, Hey, we're going to take you in another car that you don't feel comfortable with, with guys you don't know. Uh, and he, he, he bolted and he told me at the, the worst case, they were going to kill him best case. They were going to give him a, a, you know, a severe beating. Um, so Frank, so I got, I got pretty close to Frank. Um, he let me, he, well, he asked Taco, uh, if Taco would talk to me on the phone and I got about, I don't know, two, three, three, four minutes. Uh, one now this time. is a, uh, after Taco was convicted. So this Taco's convicted, he's doing life in prison. Frank the bomb, uh, who was free throughout. He did a lot of jail time back in the day, but his last prison sentence was from like 87 to 90 or something. And from like 90 forward, he was free until he died in the late 2010s. Um, But he talked to Taco quite a bit uh, on the phone on a regular basis because they were such close friends. And I was with Frank a couple times when Taco called. um, And I said to him one time, I was like, hey, the next time Taco calls you, would you mind... Uh, allowing me to to you know, grab the phone and, and just introduce myself. 
So we asked Taco if it would be okay. You know, there was nothing, nothing earth shattering. I just jumped on the phone. Was he and, was he aware of your reporting? Did Taco yeah. know who you well, were? Well, he knew. He didn't really know my name. He knew the book Motor City Mafia where he oh, had I been, see. Had He's been a picture in. of him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he had been aware of the article that we wrote. Me and Jimmy wrote an article. Oh yeah. For CBS. CBS. Yeah. CBS. Uh, for their website about uh, the bikers in Detroit, but I don't. He didn't know Scott Bernstein as a, um, as a name as a reporter name, but he knew some of the stuff I had written about him when yeah. I when I reminded him of it. And um, I mean, what 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 can you really take away from three or four minutes? But you know, I'd say as a you know for for my uh, reporting, it was um, it was it was pretty uh important uh you know uh, to to be able to get it's not facetime i guess but just to be able to uh talk to somebody um like that someone that you've reported on someone that you've learned about and even if it's for three or four minutes um it, it has value and i and i i really appreciated it um even though if it was it was a lot of small talk and um I, it was it's something that I'll always remember, and uh, I was proud that I could say that a couple years after that, uh, I broke the story of his death. Um, I think it was in nineteen eighteen. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. Um, let me uh, just double check it. But uh, I um, I was the one who broke that story. I got tipped off. Two thousand nineteen. Uh, 2019 spring i believe it was or winter february or march of, march oh, 2019 and you saw a picture of him at the end he really didn't look anything like he had looked in the past i mean i guess people you know people get older and and change and um, especially in the joint yeah but you look at the picture of him at the very end which was a like a prison mug it doesn't look anything like the photos that you see of him from the 70s 80s and 90s um but he looked good he didn't look unhealthy or old um, he just was more clean shaven. I think he had a mustache, but um, yeah, his his legacy is so um, it's so layered, and it and it's something that uh, who knows if it will ever be equaled. I mean, what what Conan Richter and the Pagans are doing right now, I definitely think they're. I've said this a couple times already in this episode. They're taking a page out of what uh, Taco did with the the outlaws in the eighties and nineties, but he, he is revered um, coast to coast outside of Sonny Barger. I don't think there's a, a more iconic or notorious, well-known, well-respected, beloved biker boss in American history than, than Taco Bowman. Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, the, like I said, the few people I've talked to, um, all all thought very highly of him even even the rivals even like george christie commented on one of our social media posts so this is public that he said um taco was a worthy adversary those were those are his words and uh the italian guy that we talked to <laughs> he thought highly of taco um I mentioned it uh um another person i know who used to run with frank and taco thought very highly of him and and even the law enforcement guys um well he was someone that always respected the law enforcement that was tracking him. He yeah, didn't the cat he didn't mouse, get into uh, screaming <laughs> matches or throwing yeah. things at them. Um he 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 took a page out of the Jackalonis and the, the Toko Zarellis here who saw law enforcement. You're doing a job, right? We're doing a job. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, even the, even the law enforcement people, it doesn't seem like it was personal. If anything, they, I think they sort of liked them. Yeah. Like, not not as they they were going to do their job, which was was. Well, they thought. I mean, but... they thought he was a, uh, you know, they thought he was a duplicit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, egomaniacal crime lord, but at the same time, they recognized that he he had some you know charisma about him and. Uh, like I said, they had a, a level of respect for those guys where he didn't let his people disrespect right. the the ATFs and DEAs and FBIs that were were going after them. Um, it was always cordial. I, I, tacos, you know, another part of his legacy, tying it back to the start of the show. You know, he he was 
the definition of a leader and somebody that could easily adapt to whatever situation he was in and interact with whoever was on the other side of that table, whether it be law enforcement, George Christie, his top lieutenant, or, you know, just anybody that, that he would um, be doing business with or, or socializing with. Uh, he was somebody that um, wore a lot of hats and could easily shift from one mode to another. And, and I don't, again, I don't want to belabor it, but it's, it's just interesting to see one, you know, I've seen a lot of FBI surveillance photos of him and to see him in all of his outlaw garb. And when he's amongst all the outlaws and he almost, he almost looks like a warlord, mm -hmm. you know, like a he's got the, like he's a the long native hair. American warlord. He was very dark complected. That's why they called him taco. Um, and he'd have the long hair and he'd have all the tattoos and he looked like out of central casting for a biker movie. And then you see a surveillance photo that was taken literally 48 hours later or a week later. And his hair is all tied up. He's in a, a three piece suit. Um, it, it just uh, you never saw that before. Sonny Barger wasn't dressing up in three piece suits to meet with with other criminals or other businessmen. Um, he was in a category of taco was in a category all by himself in terms of how he understood uh, the way the game was played. He was playing chess when everybody else was playing checkers. Yeah. It, it's um, there's no, there's no book about taco as far as I know. Um, and you know, that seems like some, some journalist out there um, or some writer should probably, should probably take, take that up because it, it was a really fascinating Fascinating story. Fascinating and, uh, life. Just, you know, to, to put a bow on this, his all you needed to know about his legacy played out in, at his funeral. Mm -hmm. They had to literally rent the Ohio State Fairgrounds. They had 5,000 people at this thing. Mm -hmm. um, Including biker, other biker clubs. Who bikers from there. around the country descended on uh it was around dayton ohio uh, in the dayton ohio area biker um, clubs that they don't necessarily get along with yeah e were, were even there so it was like a uh a viking funeral <laughs> um where uh people from around the land came to pay their respects um to you know the 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 midwest sunny barger i mean that's that the, there's no other comparison I mean, it's Sonny Barger and Taco and then everybody that came after. Yeah. And that's not counting the Canada, you know, Mom Boucher. I'm not trying to disrespect yeah. uh, the, the the very famous biker bosses. From no, but Canada, in, the, in the United States, those yeah. are the two big names, I, I right. think, his, historically, you know. Well, it, it's it's interesting. We hope people find this interesting. And, and um, you know, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And uh if you have other ideas for, 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 you know, important, significant underworld figures you'd like us to talk about in this life and crimes edition, hit us up on the socials and, and let us know. Uh, please subscribe, follow us. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. I'm Scott Bernstein. We're out.